Man, I got a, a, a my my one of my best friends. I can't believe it was a Laker, and uh, <laughs> I absolutely had so much fun with him. Didn't get the chance to know Norm Nixon until I played with Norm when we were both playing with the Clippers, and we be just we just became huge friends. And uh, man, welcome to my podcast, man. Just really welcome. Got Joe Sway on here, but just welcome. What's up, Norm? Norm Nixon, how you doing? Look, 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 Max, it's always a pleasure. I think players on a certain level have like minds. I don't think you can be a champion and do certain things if you don't have the same mentality, the, the discipline, the work ethics, and all those things that make championship players. And I think it was very easy for us to learn how to play together and click together on and off the court, you know? Man, I always, just way the thing I loved about Norm, and, and, and I'll have to get right to it, because Norm, they keep talking about this... Uh, Winning time with the Lakers, which yeah. you yes. said you haven't seen. Great show. But, I saw but, the pilot. Yeah. I watched the pilot. But okay. That was well, it. What, but what I get out of this is, and and I know, and you, I'll take the take this a good way. I know your arrogance. I know the way you <laughs> played. I know that your persona. The thing they said about Magic Johnson when you played him at the Playboy Mansion is that true or not? Because yeah. yeah. that's my first so, question. So let's that's just, my let's, first question. Let's break. Let's break it down to a couple. And of I know things. you saw the pilot. Yeah. Well, number one, it was in the summertime. Yeah, and so you had a fur coat on. So I had a full length fur coat on. Come on, at a white party in the summertime. That's the first <laughs> thing. The, the 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 main thing never happened. Never happened. Okay. Okay. I don't think I ever played Magic one on one. All the years we we played together, <laughs> what four years? We never played one on one. You know how it is. Right, well, you don't do that. You play shooting games and stuff. That's just uh, how about the, you came up with. All right. Well, how about the constant constant uh, intimidation? I guess for the for the rookie no. before he even played his first game. Well, this is the thing. Uh, well, we, we break that down. Number one, I'm from Macon, Georgia. Man, I'm from the country, and I wore my country this with pride. There was nothing I would. Uh, call somebody and use it in a derogatory fashion. I mean, Max is country. We're from the country, man. We didn't grow up in New York and Boston and Chicago. We were country boys that city guys always talked about. Like, we couldn't play. Oh, you from the country. Uh, you okay, played okay, with okay. cowbells. I used to say, yeah, I did all that stuff. Just <laughs> roll the ball out. And we'll talk about it after we play. So, number one, that, that kind of stuff would never happen. And number two, you know, I actually said it to my son. When, when they drafted Magic, I wasn't intimidated or worried about magic i wanted to win and i wasn't worried about my job i knew with magic coming in they were going to figure out a way for us to play together i wasn't worried about him coming in taking my job that wasn't even in my mentality and max knows that you know i put in the work man so i wasn't concerned about magic coming to take my job it was like how are we going to play together more than anything else in the offense it was never about i'm going to sit down and he was going to play but were you oh, I and, concerned about. and here, yeah. here's the here's the, the kinship that I believe that we had. You had I had Larry Bird come in after I averaged 19 points a game and 10 rebounds. And then you have magic and you were already established as a player. Yeah. And you're thinking, like, man, I'm not by, and I know you and I and I know me. We ain't bowing down to nobody. We ain't kissing no. nobody's ass. So it was a competitive thing, but I know the thing that you saw because you're smart, just like me, was like, this dude can help me and I can help him get to where we need to go. Come on, man, you play with DJ. I was tired of DJ and Gus double teaming me, man, because before <laughs> that, you know, I played with guys, you know, I played with Lou Huss and Ron Boone's guys that were great players in, in, in their youth, but they were older guys. And I was running up against all these young guards so they could really focus on me. So I was happy to find a guy that could take some of that heat off of me so I can do what I needed to do out on the court. That makes sense. I mean, I think that's the picture they're trying to paint because obviously there was a lot of hype surrounding Magic Johnson and going into his rookie season. So I guess natural, it was natural for them to come up with that narrative that, oh, he's going to take your spot. But you know, that's exactly what the show is running with right now. I feel like these first two, three episodes, the season hasn't even started yet. The regular yeah. season hasn't started yet on the show, but there's a lot of tension right now, you know, leading well, into the, you know, another, going through training another, camp. Another piece of insight, and, and Max would tell you this, we didn't watch college basketball, man. We might have watched that championship game because if you weren't Kareem, you weren't coming in, turning a team around. You come mm. in and be a great piece to an established team. But if you take Kareem from our team, man, we wouldn't have won nothing. So it wasn't like you have a Kareem that comes in and your team was winning 15 games. And all of a sudden, you're going to win 50 games. 
guys just didn't have that impact. And I don't think they have it even in today's game. So there are very few guys like a Kareem or a Moses Malone that walked into the game and immediately you could chalk up 30 more wins. So mm-hmm. I wasn't like, oh, this guy's going to turn our team around and make us a championship team. It was like, oh, no, he's a great piece to come in to help complement all the pieces we have so we can win a championship. But let's well, say Kareem. They are oh, sorry, sure doing something right now when it comes to Jerry West. I mean, they're beating man. Jerry up. They're beating Jerry up like he's a, a piñata. I mean, like, man, this was one of the greatest players, one of the greatest and front minds. office guy. You know, I had yeah. my own individual problems with that. But again, this guy, uh, the, the, the show is based off a book. He never interviewed me. Mm. I don't know this guy. So whatever he knows about me would be the insight from whatever articles and maps would tell you that those things are never hundred percent accurate. They'll hear some rumors. They'll write about it as if they were sitting next to you. Now, the only insight they do it, it is my son playing the part. So he'll have a little bit of insight, but I wasn't going to tell him nothing uh, that I wouldn't want the media to know. I mean, Max, mm-hmm. and Ted, we had rules, man. You don't talk about what we do in the locker room to people outside the locker room. That's why we're in it together. I mean, just like I hear the Lakers, uh, whether it was Swaggy P, got video by somebody and they put it on social media. Now we, yeah, his own teammate, his own yeah, teammate. So we didn't his have, his have social media back at that time, but you can yeah. believe if somebody had filmed something like that and put it out, he'd have to dress in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't come in the locker room no more, man. We didn't play that kind of stuff, you know? No, I'm the, the thing that was crazy about it to me when I saw the, <laughs> And, and I haven't seen that much of it, but when it just came on, I'm like, damn, that guy they got playing on next to him. That's a hell of a job. That's Norm's son. I was like, oh, yeah. And I remember when this dude was born. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. Really? Oh, man. So, so this is the thing, man. We I talked to him about it. I said, look, man, I said, make your money. You know, go make your money. Don't make me look too stupid. Well, Dad, you know, I'm going to do interviews, and uh, I'm going to tell them. I said, look, man, nobody's going to be watching your interviews. I said, man, people watch this stuff. They think it's a documentary. Well, Dad, you know, they just send the character up. I don't think I even talked to him since he did. <laughs> oh, man. He didn't get he had, I, I he did the research, man, man. Because he's on Snowfall. He did a good job on Snowfall. But if yeah, this can yeah. be the springboard for him to get a lot of work, so be it. But just, you know. He's killing me on this show, so he owes me a lot of money. But it's like, hey, man, you know, go feed yourself. Go make some money, but be careful, man, because we're all living around here. And then, you know, I'm your dad, man. I don't be answering questions like you asked me. Man, did you really put on a fur coat and play? <laughs> man, I know the people that know me know it's all crazy. And he said, yeah, we are arrogant and stuff, but you can't make it in the NBA, man, if you don't think you're good. Now, whether you yeah, yeah. sit around and brag about it is a different story. You have to have confidence in yourself. Think you're better than the guys that you're playing against. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to be in the league. Now, whether you're going to go sit around and talk about it, like Max says that to me, because he and I can sit down and talk about it. And I'll tell him what I think about players. But it's not for me to sit around and dog guys in the press and talk about them. I never talked on the court. I just say, hey, man, roll the ball out. We'll talk well, wait, 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 wait. I don't want to hear up, that. Mac? You're talking about, I ain't never talked to I used to love Norm Nixon because he was as good as anybody his size and some of these guys even bigger than him. Boy, he gave John Stockton the blues. And I remember that. That was, that was Norm's guy. Norm was like, Hall of Famer. <laughs> no, <laughs> no just like, man, he would say, Max, give me the damn ball and get out of the way. And I see, and I see John Stockton coming back holding his throat. I'm like, yep, no, I'm got it. No, I'm got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so, know. so so for you to say you didn't talk noise, I'm not yeah. oh, sure to you. That, I've heard you several times talking, playing on the court when I was out right. there. Now, listen, listen, I'll say something to a guy. If a guy said it to me out on the court, I'll whisper in somebody's ear in a minute. You know how that is, Max. They start talking too much. It's like, hey, man, you got the wrong one. You know, so I was quick to whisper. I did that in quite a few guys' ear as we played. But come on, Max, we all did that. We were, yeah, that's true. We we were ballers, man. We were were ballers, man. And somebody challenged you, you challenged them. You didn't have to do all that screaming out loud. You whisper in the ear. 
All right, I'll tell you what, do that again and watch what happens. <laughs> you ever see that's the, those are the stories that if I'm Devon, I want to hear those, right? I want to watch your tell own him game. because he'd go put I'm it on pick the up air. your mannerisms. <laughs> yeah. He put it on the air. See, I'm not a part of that. It's my my personal stuff is not for television. I heard they have someone going to play my wife. I wasn't even with the Lakers when I got married. Wow. Norm, <laughs> Norm likes to use. That was that was one of Norm's lines he would say, dude, I'm about to go out here and bust this guy's ass. That's what I'm going to do right now. <laughs> and then, <laughs> that was his line. And I'd be like, you are? Yeah, you just, just watch and, you know, get out of the way. So I remember many times. Now, you know, I, I'm going to advance a little bit because we're going to jump back and forth because you are my boy. But but the slap heard around the world because you're in Hollywood. And this uh, this this slap that you saw Will Smith do yeah. on Chris Rock, you know, how did that how did that go in your home? Because your wife's an actress. Well, uh, you know, you know, know, my wife, my wife, my wife uh, directed the pilot of Fresh Prince in the first three or four shows. She's oh, also uh, put Jada Pinkett on a different world. So I've been knowing Jada since she was a very young girl, you know, before she was married, known Will for a long time. Uh, just told it out of place, man. It, it was just, it's, it's right. the wrong place. If there was some, again, Max, you know how we are. We ballers. If somebody did something to you, you, you take them backstage. Out in, in, in the back and you're handling say, man, do this again. It wouldn't have been three or four years smoldering before I go react in this kind of environment. So I I don't understand it, man. And then you hit a guy and you turn your back. I would have bust his eardrum. <laughs> 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 you go to the nerd and smack me with millions of people walking because people go, oh, he is so professional. No, my profession little would have gone straight out of the window, man. <laughs> you, you, know crazy, you know what's crazy? You know what's crazy about it? Huh? You know what's crazy, Norm? You know what's crazy about it too? So he's in Boston right now. He did a show last night. Oh, and everyone's pissed off. Chris Rock, right? Chris Rock had a show here in Boston. Everyone here is pissed off because he didn't talk about it throughout his routine. I'm like, this guy needs weeks, maybe months to process this thing before he starts writing jokes about it. I mean, he got slapped on national television while doing his job. Like, that's not an easy thing to turn around and start flipping jokes three days later, you know? Well, it must be really embarrassing for him too, man. You got hit on national television. That's what I mean. And you didn't do nothing. You know, people talk about professionalism. You know, all my friends have different takes on that. <laughs> <laughs> Max, what's your take on it? Oh, no. oh you man. know me. I, you know how I was. And, yeah. and Norm, no, one of Norm's favorite stories is uh, that he loves when I played with him uh, with the Clippers, that we, we were playing a game against Charles Barkley. And this is when Charles was at his best. And, you know, he was – but when he had this nasty habit of doing something and throwing the ball and hitting you. And we were looking at the film, and he throws the ball at a player. It was McHale. He actually hit McHale with it. Boom. And, and we're playing him next. And I said, Norm, if he does that shit to me, I'm going to go in his ass. I'm gonna and Norm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. <laughs> so, no. So, we get in the game. We get in the game. And, and exactly this thing happens. I'm, I take a charge, and he has a ball in his hand, and he hits me with the ball. And then what happens, Norm? Max rolled up and stuck it. <laughs> oh, bam, bam. I fell out laughing, man. I started laughing so hard. And then, but the best part is we went to Philly. He took the same charge, and then Charles helped him up. I was just going to ask about that. <laughs> oh, then he winked at me. <laughs> Let me hear. I want to hear your side of it with, the, with Charles Barkley, that, that whole thing. <laughs> oh, no, that that happened. I mean, it happened. I just said, okay, Max, I see what you do. Okay, we'll see. I hear you. I hear you. And the exact same play happened. He took the charge, and Charles hit him with the ball. Max came straight up and, and put a three-piece on him. Charles <laughs> and then the next time he took the charge, he helped him up. So I've been waiting to be on the show. So if you ever say somebody tough he is, I'm sure going to bring that up. There, there are things about uh, that that whole environment with the Lakers now, and because you're around it. One, one thing I always said that happened with me was I think Kobe Bryant was actually coming in to the Staples Center at that time, and you and I—that's when you were doing the little pregame for the Lakers, and you and I were talking, and Kobe was coming in, and you said, "Hey, you want to meet Kobe?" And I said, "Sure." And you brought me over to Kobe, and and from then on, we had you know, a very cordial relationship. And he would see me in Boston. He would speak and 
And his last game against the Celtics, he came and he talked to me, man. It was just, it was just really nice to see him talk about all the stuff. And I, I loved it, man. And I was just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, but I'll, I'll say this about Kobe. Very respectful guy. Plus, he knew the history of the game. Mm -hmm. See, the problem with a lot of these guys, they don't know the history of the game and the guys that came before him, before them. So he's always been very respectful of that and uh, with all the guys. So for me, his whole time out there, if he saw me, just the ultimate of respect, just the ultimate. How you doing, Norm? Nice to see you. A big supporter of our dance academy. I think he had started doing stuff after basketball to redefine his whole thing. He was big into women's sports, great support mm -hmm. of a whole lot of causes. And it made me look at him even different because that guy that go out on the court, man, was an assassin. You know, it was right. like he was, he had tunnel vision when he went out on that court, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, to see him off the court and in that type of an environment, in a different environment, and then after the game, to see all the different things he was doing, animated movies, the children's book, because he had a special relationship with his daughter. So he was a big supporter of women's sports. So he had just started making his mark off the court, man. And it was horrible news for me because I got to know him a lot better after he retired. And it was, it, it was a tough blow. No, I'm just just lost. Yeah, oh, real, quick, real quick, man. What's going on right now with the Lakers stuff? The, well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I should, I should, I should, uh, I'm not going to call the, the player's name. It's a player doing I heard that was a great player. He said uh, uh, LeBron got his, um, his dream AAU team. Him, Carmelo <laughs> Anthony, Anthony <laughs> Davis, and Westbrook. <laughs> but he got him too late. I thought that was a great line. But listen, Max, you know, the league now, man. Max called us. You got these one. analytic guys to sit up here and talk about shoot more threes and you win if you shoot all the threes. They got now big guys to shoot threes. You know what we would have said if our center was out there shooting <laughs> threes. They want big guys to play like European big guys. That's why you go to the Olympics. You don't know if they're going to win or not because we don't have any big guys anymore that can play. They don't want big guys that can play on the box. So with this whole thing now, the, the free agency, guys want to go buy a team versus building a team you know if you look at in our day you had the same guys for eight nine ten years you have a foundation you draft guys could play and again we were first round draft choice when you came in as a first round draft choice you had to play it wasn't not we're going to draft you when you're 18 years old and develop you because you don't know what you're going to get in three or four years they still got in a high school game playing against high school guys oh he's a top 10 pick and I think we mentioned it. I was an agent at one time. I never forget sitting back there one time. All the high school All Americans went in the top half of the draft. The college All Americans went in the second half because their their philosophy was, well, why do he have to stay in college for four years? If he was that good, he would have left at the high school. They had drafted the high school All American before they drafted the college All American. Wow. So the game is kind of upside down right now. But buying a team is what they did. So they got the one championship. They bought it. Now they need to tear this thing down and rebuild it. Yeah, that's, what that's I true. They flipped all their future first round picks in the process, right? And so now all you, of those boys you don't have those play. to hold back on. Yeah. All of them could play. They were all good young players. I was sitting there watching. Look at all these guys, Randall in New York, all those guys down in Brandon Ingram down there, Hart, who mm -hmm. I love, from Villanova. All these guys yeah. could play ball. You know, look at my man at Utah Bondo. coming off the bench, you know. You got six man of the year. All these Cal, guys, Cal Kuzma. Kuzma. Yeah, Kuzma. Mm -hmm. I always love Kuzma. So Washington. if you have these young guys for a few years, now you add a LeBron and you add somebody else. Now you got something. That's what they did. We had Kareem. They added all of us to play with Kareem. Mm -hmm. You know, a bunch of young guys that knew how to play. And they had yeah. a bunch of young guys that could play. I always thought it was a mistake. And now they're paying the price for uh, getting rid of all those guys and buying, buying these uh, veteran guys. I think it's because LeBron just built it. Or after what happened in Miami and after what he did in Cleveland, I think he just had this mindset that he has to have that big three again, you know. And although Anthony Davis was there, they were able to win that championship in the bubble. They wanted to add more, and I, I just look. I gotta give props to Max, man. From the very beginning, he was like, "There's no way this is gonna work." I didn't see them as a the top tier team in the in the West, but I thought they would at least make the playoffs, and that that may not be the case now. You know? Well, I it's, thought they would make the playoffs. My whole thing at the beginning of the season is like. In order to be a great team, you got to get 20 or 30 games on the court together. 
I never saw these guys being healthy enough to play 30 games together so they could figure it out. You can't just mm-hmm. come in at the end of the season and all of a sudden you're going to be a great team. You got to get some reps on the court and you got to practice. These guys don't practice. Yeah. They heard all this, all this, what, time management, load management stuff. <laughs> come on, man. If you, if you play two games, miss two games, you can't ever get rhythm. Kyrie, you play at home, you don't play, you play on the road, can't play at home, you play here, you can't play. Now, when you don't play a guy start, he gets a rhythm, you come back, he has to sit down. It's a rhythm game. You mess up the rhythm of your team. It's all about rhythm and learning how to play together. You can't get in a rhythm if this guy's in and out, and then, you know, Kyrie likes the ball. So now all of a sudden, you don't get the ball. You used to touching the ball. Now you don't touch the ball. Now you're touching the ball. But then you have analytic guys sitting there going, oh, well, you know, you can do that. No, you can't do that. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Your advice right now to, and you, you, you're watching it right there in LA, your advice to Westbrook would be what? Well, this, this is the thing, man. I never thought Westbrook was a, was a point guard. He's never been a point guard. He was just a scorer, this athletic. If you watch him, because if, if, if he had that point guard mentality, they would have won down in Oakland. I mean, in OKC. They would have won there because they had so much talent with all these great players, but they start competing against each other one-on-one. If you look at those losses in OKC, he'd have three turnovers. Uh, uh, Durant have three turnovers. In the last two minutes, they'll be up and they'll lose a game because nobody's out there running the team, uh, um, making them take the right shots to the decision-making. So if, if I was Westbrook at this stage in his career, I'd say, Hey, man, just play. Don't listen to this stuff. Attack the bucket. Stop taking all these threes. Don't fall into this. I'm a three-point shooter. Just start back shooting. Just start back getting in that paint like you used to. Get your mid-range game together. And then every time you feel bad, Mac, you got 40 million. (laughs) (laughs) They couldn't make me mad. (laughs) Boy, your sway, I could have got a dollar to a donut. It was going to come up. I was going to say, no, be like, man, that ain't changed that man's checks or nothing. But it, it, it's, it, it is, it's almost hard to see as a play. And, you know, I, how I feel about the Lakers and, you know, me and James Worthy talking noise, Michael Thompson talking to all that. But I really kind of feel bad for Westbrook in the position he's in because, now he's home in LA. He's gonna get forty million dollars next year. But where will he, in your opinion, where will he be next year? Because he can't well, he be making, he making too much money. I think he has another year left on his contract. Nobody's yeah. gonna take him. But 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 this this is the other thing too that happened to him. And and this is a basketball analogy. You'll get this one. Larry Bird could always shoot. Because he wasn't jumping out of the gym. He was shooting a jump shot. He's jumping this high off the floor to shoot his jump shot. Westbrook, like me, we were jump shooters. Jumps so we were high, yeah. going jumping in the air. So now our knees are hurting. So it's not the quite, you're not looking at it the same. Now guys that couldn't get their hands in front of your shot, all of a sudden they up here. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to change your game. So I don't think he has anybody over there to say, man, you got to change your game a little bit. You're not jumping like you. You see him now, I see him going to the cup, stuff he would have dunked. Now he's below the yeah. rim. Yeah. So sometimes these guys don't deal with the reality of where their games are. So I think he has to understand where his game is now. And that's why, Max, that's why they need veteran guys sometimes to be in the ear to mm. talk to them about, because we all went through it. None of us was the same in year 11 and 12 as we were one, two, and three. Right. Like I said, I walked into the league, man. I had never sprung an ankle, probably. Jumping off both hands, either foot to dunk. By the time I got to my 10th year, it wasn't a jump, and I didn't want to land. <laughs> like every time I came down, I was like, oh, oh. And you know, Max, I was used to going, boom, and buy somebody. All of a sudden, yeah. I'm crossing over. The guy's still there. I go down the other he's still there. I'm like, oh, man, I can't get by nobody anymore. So, you know, his game has changed. His well, game it's, also has generation, changed. it's also a generational thing, though, right? I feel like the score first point guard nowadays there's a lot on their shoulders, right? Whether it's attacking the rim, the herky-jerky moves with the knees to, to get to the cup or jumping as high as they can to, to, to knock down threes. I, a lot of these score-first point guards, once they hit 33, 34, they start coming up with a bunch of issues. You know, Kemba Walker being a, a good example of somebody who was relatively healthy his entire career, and all of a sudden all these injuries start popping up. Listen, it's too hard, man. It's, it's too hard. And, I, and I'll say this 
about myself. I could have scored a lot more points. It's too hard when you're little because mm -hmm. you got to outrun people all the time. You got to out jump people all the time. Our guys love playing with me because listen, I don't want to do all that shooting. I want two other guys to average 20 or some right. point. I'll get my 16 to 17. That was always my mentality. I don't care if, because you're not going to win. You're not going to win if I'm your leading scorer because mm -hmm. it's too easy to take me out of the game. All you got to do is beat me up and double team me. I can't do nothing. You can, you can double Kareem all you want to. He still is going to score. So for little guys, point guard, again, I'll back up because this league is a little different because Golden State won it. But what people don't uh, uh, mess enough is they had Bogut in a couple of those games. Bogut would mm -hmm. block three or four shots, get 12 rebounds in the first half, and they'll go up 20 and the game's over. He'll end the game with two points, 10 rebounds, and three blocks. But his effectiveness when the game started, people overlooked that stuff. So point guards, these scoring point guards, I never thought a team with Kimball Walker could win a championship because he's too dominant offensively. You're not going to win when you're a little guy. It's your main scorer. The same thing happened with Phil Love AI, but you weren't going to win if he was going to be your leading scorer. Yeah, they didn't need a wing. Big games would be five man. for 30, five for yeah. 40. You need some guys on that box, and you need two or three other guys that can score from your team. No, right, the, real quick, the, I, I got a thing, oh, thing oh, I never oh, heard oh, from you was why did they why did they trade you? Well, what was the story there? Because you keep hearing like, well, Magic said he didn't want to play with you no more, or this happened or that. What is the real story? From I think I think the real story behind it, Jerry West and I clashed. And I always thought when he became general manager, if he had ever had an opportunity to uh, trade me, he would. So I think it started up there. Uh, I don't think, I really, in my heart of hearts, I don't think Magic was involved in getting me traded. Um, do I think he went in and fought for me? No. But it's, it's management make trades. You can say whatever you want to say. Management has to make decisions because they didn't want to do it. They'll say, no, I don't care who you are. You know, so I think it was that. And, and, and again, because uh, Matt, you, you know me, I, I am arrogant in a certain sense because I'm no nonsense. If, if somebody tell me to run into the wall, I'm not running into the wall. I'm going, man, I'm not doing that. So I did always have that in me. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'll just give you an example of something that happened. This is, this is my arrogance. Because I know if coaches differentiate between how they treat other players, it's going to be a problem in your locker room. Yeah. And I'll say this. Okay, Kareem, never late, always on time. That's one thing I say about Cap. Practice every day. We had to make him sit down because we wanted him in the game. He said, Cap, come on, man, sit down. We got to play, even when he got older. So Kareem has a bad week, right? It rained a lot. He lived in Bel Air. He said he was flooded. So he came to practice late, like two or three days in a row. He came late because he said he was flooded. And so Max will tell you this, when somebody come in late, we may stop and laugh, especially this Larry or Max, because these guys don't get fined. You want to make say, hey, man, you got to find them too. So we laughed and clapped. So we go into a huddle. And uh, Paul West said, go, you know what, guys? We should stop finding people for being late because, you know, because he didn't want to find Kareem. We should stop oh, finding wow. guys. You guys are pros. I mean, it was something to that effect. I, you know, I don't know. But whatever it was, he wanted to stop because he didn't want to take Cap's money three days in a row, right? <laughs> so my little arrogant butt go, coach, because we now, we like in January, February, second half of the season. So my little butt is like, hey, coach, you know what? He said, what? I said, I think if we're going to stop finding everybody's money you took the first half of the season, you should give it back to them. Right, right, <laughs> refund. <laughs> you know that. You know he looked at me then. He looked at me and was like, <laughs> he wanted to kill me. But I know what that creates in the locker room. You know, even though we know you got to, you know, look, you star, you got to do a little bit. You know, like for Allen Iverson, he goes say, practice. I ain't coming to practice. He got to come to the coach and say, coach, I'm tired. Come to practice and coach, hey, Alan, why don't you go home? You can't just not show up and then say that on television. You know, we're going to all look out for your super guys logging a lot of minutes. Maybe you show up and say, man, you guys go sit on the side of stuff. But you don't come in and go practice. I ain't coming to the practice. That creates dissension. And if you're going to win a championship, you can't have that kind of stuff in your locker room. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh. Well, let me ask you this about Kareem, because this is another thing that, that's been on the show. Uh, his, his treatment for the rookies, the 6 a.m. orange shoes, how he likes his orange shoes. And is that, is that accurate whatsoever in terms of how he was with now, the rookies? 
I, you know, I don't know how they treated other rookies. Tell them, Max, do you know how they treated other rookies? I was logging too many minutes to do that. So rookies, they would say, bring the balls. I don't think they did anything ex extreme. You know, if you were rookies, they'd say, hey, man, you because we only had, what, three coaches and one trainer. Now they got 18 people over on the sideline. <laughs> so they might say, rookies, y'all got to help with the balls. A rookie, you got to help do some stuff like that. But again, for a guy like Max, I'm sure it's like that, just like with me. You know, I almost led the league in minutes my, my rookie year. So nobody was going to tell me to uh, uh, go get some balls and stuff, and I got to log all these minutes. So a little extreme. Uh, I, um, I, I look at that, Norm, and people talk about the new NBA and, and all the things that are happening. Your perspective on the NBA is something I've always kind of, because you're on the, the West Coast, and here I'm on the East Coast, and you are a making Georgia dude. So yep. your, your your mindset, looking at LeBron James and looking at these guys, and I know how you are. You and I were born way too soon because I I couldn't see them paying Norm Nixon twenty five million dollars a year without. Oh my God, there would be some shit going on. Twenty five <laughs> million a year. <laughs> what would they have been able to say to you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 Max, but you know our mindset, too. It would be like, the way they paying, I'm going to work out and stay healthy so I can get my next one. <laughs> I need to make 250 300 Now, Norm, Norm tells this story, which I, I love, Josue. He, he tells me, we had, a, we had a coach. His name was Greenberg, right? Uh, <laughs> and Brad Greenberg, and Brad, brand new in the NBA, talking noise to everybody. And here I am in my 11th or 12th year, and, you know, I am the 99th highest paid athlete in the world. And Brad Greenberg said something to me, and Josue, I said, and Norm loved this. I said, Brad, what I'll do, I'll go get all my money out of the bank, put it in the airplane, and drop it on your house, and kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he said that. No, no he, he, he never said that coach never said another word to me. He after turned, that. He no, turned no, so no. red, man. I was crying. That was a perfect guy. You know? <laughs> that was so funny, man. I love that one. <laughs> now nah, we had we had some good bus with some good times, man. The bus the bus rides were the best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just love that the the new NBA. But I, I I have to get back to that though, Norm. Could you imagine in your wildest dreams? making 25, 26, 30 million dollars a year for I know you would love it, but can you imagine how that is? And you just oh, watch I can't, you know what, Max, is so we all like to say uh, uh with inflation and all this stuff, man, it's 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 so far out there. I, I will I will um do a disclaimer. I'm happy these guys are making it because they didn't it goes to the owners. So I'm yeah, glad mm -hmm. they they are the ones that creates create this money. I'm happy they're sharing in it. I just like to uh, see them leave with the money. You you don't read as many stories about them losing as much money as the stories where we were because we didn't really make no money. So I'm happy these guys are making it. I think they have a huge platform. I love that a lot of these guys do speak out on certain issues, but I think some of them get lost because I think they get drunk with a little bit of power that they have and, and they don't realize the NBA is fine without them. Uh, you know, I, I look at the young boy, that was over there in Philly now. That's with New Jersey, Ben Simmons, you know? So I don't think he understood. It's like, dude, you you in the second or third year of like a $100 million country, man, go to training camp. You can't, sometimes mm. you can't force a trade. You're running to this guy to say, you know what? Don't play. We'll just find you every game you miss. Now it's been health issues. It's all that. And I think that's a, that's a great case where if he had somebody like yourself in his ear or one of these former players, there, it's like, hey, man, you go play. Let your play and do it. The, the more they mess with you, the harder you work out. The more they mm. mess, the harder you work out, the more you stay, you do everything right now, collect your money, man, and you'll get in a better position eventually. Because right. if, if you plan, somebody's going to sign you. Well, you know what, things, Norm? I, I think I honestly, ask, this is a generational ahead. thing, too. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, no, it's a generational ahead. thing, too. Ahead, I mean, with social media and what the narrative is, I feel like players nowadays, they care way more about what the narrative is about them you know, in, in contrast to what the team is going to do and, and what their, you know, what their contribution means to the team. You know, it's more about what their narrative is out there. And I think a lot of that had to do with 
guys like you know head coach Doc Rivers not saying like, hey, Ben Simmons can can be when he got that question. Can Ben Simmons lead a team to the NBA Finals? I'm not quite sure. I think he took that as a slap, but other guys would say, hey, that's a that's something that should motivate you for the upcoming season, not the other way around. Well, you know, you're the generation. You guys are also entitled. <laughs> <laughs> it's true we talk about our no, kids hey. <laughs> you Facts. guys no listen, listen listen it's a different world right now with social media man i don't i'm you know i'm not big on it but you know nothing's private anymore i mean people right. go on vacations they take they post in everything they do every that's why so many of them are getting robbed <laughs> I'm over here. Oh, he's been <laughs> home. Let's go rob the house. You read about these NBA guys getting robbed. They already know your schedule. So we used to be paranoid about our schedules anyway. But now they posting stuff. I'm on vacation yeah. for three weeks. Oh, man, we can go get his house. And it's happening a lot. With, yeah, with but what about players, with everybody. What about someone like Kevin Durant coming up with fake Twitter accounts so that he can boost himself up to counteract the, the criticism? I mean, this thing's... These things matter to these guys because they're getting these messages like they're getting hate, you know, tweets or whatever, like a text message. You know, the way you would get mis, a text message. Mis, where misplaced you and Mac didn't have to deal with that while you were playing. Well, misplaced energy too, because with a lot of these guys, you know, when I was representing and I just tell them all that, well, you know, summertime, I want to do a record label, I want to do this. I said, man, where are you gonna make your most money from? Playing ball. Summertime, you need to get in shape, let your body heal, work out, relax and stop all this other craziness. Now you can start trying some things, but you're gonna make your most money playing basketball. Don't ever forget that. Yeah, he'll, they'll pay him 100,000, 200,000 to tweet something. Dude, you're making 40 million. You're making 40 million, you're making $20 million a year off your shoe contract. Do that. One thing I'll give LeBron credit for, he spent a lot of money staying in shape. He spends a lot of money with trainers and nutritionists and. Now, that's a well-spent million dollars if he spent it, because if he can add another year in his career, he can make another 60 million. Yeah. So I yeah. think some of these guys, the energy and, and the effort is misplaced. And I think that's misplaced energy and effort is that you're trying to do all of that. And if, and if you're so concerned about that, you know, that it's just weak-minded. I want to dig. I want to dig into your mind with a, and we're on, you know, kind of coming to a close. But I want to dig in your mind, and I do with. I've done this with a lot of different people. Norm Nixon, we are building something in your backyard, and we're building a um, a Mount Rushmore. You get a chance to put four different athletes on your Mount Rushmore. Who would they be? Ooh. And you can go across sports, right? You go across sports. You don't have to stay in basketball. Because I, I know you were, back back in the day, you were a pretty good baseball player too, weren't you? Well, football player. I played football. Oh, football, football player. yeah. In high school and stuff. Oh, they would have bust your little ass, but go ahead. I Quickness, gonna... baby. Quickness, baby. But you see what I played, though. <laughs> you see what I ended up playing. I, know, man, I walked into the University of Georgia, saw those big guys. I was like, whoa, hold up. Let me wait till the basketball season. Man, my Mount Rushmore. For me, I like to take it in, um, I will go across the sports. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys that I always just love in sports was Edwin Moses. Wow. He might've been the, the, the greatest 400 hurdler ever all time, won hundreds of races. I'm still mad. One year they gave Secretarius, the athlete of the year, the horse instead of giving it to him. <laughs> so I, I, I go with him. I, I go with him. Um, you know, if you go to tennis, man, you got to get Serena, man, because what she did, what she did out there, was incredible. What she did was incredible. Um, if I go to um, who else did I think just the impact. You know, man, I, I I tell you, you know, I met him a few times, but just just his stuff out on the court, man. You 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 got to go with Oscar. I mean, when I talk to those old guys and they and they, you ask them who was the best player, they all tell you Oscar. And his stats, they're still trying to break the triple doubles that he did and what he did out on the basketball court. Uh, and then if I go. Um, I'll, I'll go boxing, man. Then I have to. Then I have to go get Ali, just because I think his 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 impact, his social impact, what he stood for. And you know, Mac, Mac, we all probably didn't like him initially, 
when he first came talking too much because that's just not what we came for. <laughs> but then when you watch his impact, you watch what he did, you watch how they tried to destroy him and just all the things, all the things that um, that he did and his impact worldwide, not just here, worldwide was incredible. Man, that that's a that's a great four. You and I have let me see two of them together because I picked Serena, I yeah. picked Ali, and I picked Tiger Woods was the other one I picked. Because yeah, you can you can make yeah. the way he just changed golf for the masses. Yeah, uh, you know, even now, even now they're still trying to find guy somebody in golf to re, to just come up and and be a just a snippet of what he he's been he's, and, he's and what he did for black people. I ain't never seen black people pick up that many golf clubs before. Oh, man. I'm going to play today. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get off. <laughs> as soon as I get off. You know, and I just started playing. I got in my 50s. And you know what I found out about it, Max? It's just like, do you play now? No, I don't play yet. I've never no, played. you got to play. You got to come out there one day. You just got to go. You can't be worried about not being able to play. You got to go with somebody like me who don't care. You know, I'm not going to break no clubs. If I hit one in the wall, I'm hitting another one. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not into it like that. I enjoy it because I'm away for four hours. It's quiet. You eat. You ride around one of your partners. You talk. And then I do business stuff. So you take guys out you do business with. And, and I'm telling my son, the best place to take care of business on the golf course. You can call a CEO. You can't get a meeting. You call him and say, hey, man, I'm going to play golf. Man, they break their necks to get out of office to go play golf. So wow. just from a business perspective, they asked me at Morehouse one time, if I wanted to teach them one thing, what would I teach them? I said, I'll tell them to learn how to play golf because they'll make more money on the golf course and get more meetings than they can any other way in business. But aren't you, but that's the thing about me, Noah. I'm so competitive that I wanted to be, at least be able to beat a couple of people and I'd have to put in a lot of time yeah. and I'm not willing to put in that much time yeah. in my life. Well, this is the thing. I'm like you too. That's why I can't take it serious. Now, if I want to get serious, I'd go practice there. You know how to get good. When I go play with guys, I do get pissed off sometimes because these are 80 year old guys be beating, <laughs> hitting the ball farther than you. I hit the log all over here. You know, I'm getting pretty good now. But because I understand, I'm not willing to do what it takes to be good. I can deal with it in my head. I'm good enough where I can play with most people. Now you start playing with these guys that play four times a week, you'll never beat them. But I know if if somebody made me a bet and I'm six months out, they're gonna have a problem because you know I'm gonna practice every day. <laughs> that's what they understand our discipline when we decide to be good at something. So that's why I say you have to play with me because I don't care. You know, we'll be hitting the ball, man, hit another one. No, hit another one, Max, stay down. We go have some fun. Because every round for me is a practice round. Yeah. I'm always practicing. You know, I'll play today. I'll practice. God, okay, you hit this one good. But if I want to get good, I know what I have to do. I'm not willing to do that at this stage yet. When Max got traded to the Clippers, you guys were kind of stacked, right? So you had Derek Smith. You had you. You had Max. That team had expectations, did it not? No, we were like the Laker team. We were all 90 years old. <laughs> man, man. <laughs> you were like this year. I was, I was trying to beat hey, into play. that. We got to stay, but we want to sit down and watch some young guys play and come out there and play about 15 minutes. We was, hey, man, do this, do this. Because, look, again, you got to have your ego got to be in the right place. Come on, man. Max had had, what, two surgeries by them? Your knee had been torn up, man. I'm coming off two, three injuries. It's like, man, I don't want to be out here running with these young guys. Look, you watch the Lakers play now. I tell people now, if I was coaching the Lakers now, if I was coaching the Lakers, we're watching the game. You see LeBron miss a shot. You see the team go up the court. You never see him get in the picture. Oh, my God. You see this happen happen three or four times. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if, if, if I was coaching, if we was playing, it's like, hey, man, you got to get back across the court. But that's the indication he doesn't want to run like that. So for me... If I'm playing against him, it's like when I came in the league, I was talking to somebody, they were a big New York Knicks fan. fan. And it was my rookie year. I remember going in the guard, it was Walt Frazier and all these guys. My brother was a big Knicks fan. He was in there. I think I had almost 30 points in that game. But what made me get 30 points was it was a long rebound. Clive Frazier and I jumped for the ball, right? I slapped the ball toward my court, toward my end. 
and I took off because I knew he wasn't gonna catch me. So when I slapped it, I took off to lay it up and I looked around to see where he was. He was at the hash mark. He <laughs> barely across half court. I said, oh, man, I'm running these guys out of the gym. Yeah. I'm running them out of the gym. They'll never be able to guard me because they didn't want to run at that stage in the career. So after 10, 11, 12 years, man, you know, look, that's why LeBron want to walk the ball up court. Now you let us walk it up court and get into the old man game, we're going to punish you. But if you make me run up and down the court, man, something probably going to pop. <laughs> you know what? And, and and that is so true. That's I told people that's the connection I look at. My Clipper team was just like that. We were all really good when we played early on. Yeah. But if, but we were all old at that time. It's yeah. me, you, and Marcus. We'd all been through the wars. We, Marcus. you know, me and you have won championships and done all those things. So it was different. And people right now are saying, LeBron's having an unbelievable year. I'm like, he's scoring. But I said, I've seen LeBron turn the ball over three or four times. He doesn't even, he doesn't even come back in the picture. Before Get back the, in the pitch and transition. No, you know, no. Hey, you you know one time is too many. Yeah, you do yeah. it twice. You're supposed to be, hey, buddy, you come over here and sit with me if you can't get back on. But these coaches can't do that because, again, I look at the pedigree. If you got a coach that doesn't have the pedigree, he can't have a conversation with you because that's a bad signal. If you got young guys out there playing hard, then you got a guy that don't, don't trans, transition into defense. That's a bad sign. Now you treat him, hey, hey LeBron, when you get tired, let me know, man, so I can take you out. You can't be out here taking a shot and not cross half court, man. Come on. You can't do that. But, mm -hmm. but if you don't have anybody with the pedigree on the sideline to talk to these guys, then, you know, it's a problem. But the question I'm asking, this is for our guy, Bob McAdoo. <laughs> why do you call you? Why do you call you Mr. Biggs? Hey, yeah, I had to tell you that offline. <laughs> oh, oh man! I was, I've been thinking about that the whole time because when I talk about when I talk about Norm Biggs, yeah, the you, first thing, first thing, because, because it was something. Goddamn, Mr. Biggs. Mr. Because it's something I wouldn't do. It was something they all did that I never did. Oh, you Mr. Big. You can't do this. You can't. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sending this to Bob. I'm sending oh, you Mr. To big. So you can't do this. You just tell, you just call him Bobby Nine. Say Bobby Nine. Why you call him Mr. B? <laughs> and I'll tell you offline what that is. <laughs> okay. I'm just say Bobby Nine. <laughs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. All right. Hey, go wait, wait, wait. Before you go, I'm McAdoo. Max, yeah. I'm McAdoo because we're talking there. So say McAdoo wasn't injured and you didn't get traded. Who wins in 84? Oh, come on, Max to tell you that. It would have been a different... Listen, uh, he wouldn't answer. Say, I'll say this. You'll never say who would win, but it would have been a different series. Fair enough. Daryl Henderson would have had some nightmares with me. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been, you know, all that. Because this is invariably with the Lakers what happened a lot of times. If, when we won in 82, I was leading scorer. For the Lakers. I was the leading scorer for one reason, because the other guys got neutralized. You play against Artis Gilmore, he's kind of on Kareem. You play against Ice, Ice got magic. Mike Mitchell had silk running around in circles and all that. So the game came back to my matchup, me and Johnny Moore. So I think in that situation, DJ still, those guys still would have had to guard magic. They wouldn't have been able to guard me. So the game would have probably fell into who played the best, me or Gerald Henderson. Because all DJ and those guys did was pick Magic up for a court. And he didn't have another guy that could handle the ball. So you have to figure out, is it worse for me to handle or for Magic to handle? In a lot of cases, worse for me because of my quickness. So it would have been a different series in the sense that uh, the game would have boiled down to the matchup between me and Gerald Henderson. So that would have wow. been an interesting matchup. Actually, I'm got sure said he would have won it. And I'm sure I, I, I would have won I that have, matchup. I have nothing else to say other than you know, Nick, Norm, you know, I want to thank you, man, for coming on my podcast. You, hey, who would have won, Max? He won't say. I never heard him You're tremendous. I, I, I loved you. And, you know, you know how I feel about oh, you this and your wife and your family, man. And uh, I, I'm I'm just so happy that you and I are still around to be able to talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah, man. No, it's cool, man. Thanks for having me on. It's All right. Thing.